Spirit, my heart is your home. The doors are open, blow through every room. I want to hear your voice. I want to feel you move. Holy Spirit, so burn like Holy fire Spirit, amen. With it. Father, we come to you with gratitude for all that you have given us, for the wonders of of this world and for revealing to us your plan through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that we may uh, always know and be aware of your blessings and uh, in a special way may we come to know you during this time uh, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I follow the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this... Um, this class will be on the, the four last things plus purgatory, which is pretty much, uh, it's the, the, nobody gets all four, but some people, most people, everyone will get three of them. Um, and then some will get purgatory as well, but that's not the last thing. So what do we mean by the last things? When we talk about the last things, we talk about basically all of the end of the life stuff and everything that happens after um, death, or actually it starts at death and then it goes to judgment, heaven and hell. Right? Those things all are, are final. Right? Death is the final moment. Uh, judgment is the, the fixing of the will. And then the, the, the final resting place of heaven and hell. And then we also talk about purgatory during this time because, well, it's the most natural place to put it. Um, so we'll get there. And if, you're, if you've been going to Mass here over the last three weeks and, and then again on this Sunday, uh, this might be a lot of repeating. I'm so sorry. Um, but... But it turns out it's the same information, whether it's in a homily or whether it's in a talk. And so you don't really change a whole lot. Um, so we're going to jump right in. What do we mean when we talk about death, right? Because um, what, what do we talk about from like a Christian understanding? So uh, funny enough, if we, you know, most of the time we think of death as a very natural thing, right? It's strictly on a natural plane. Uh, the heart stops, the brain stops functioning, the lungs aren't working, nothing, none of the organs do what they're supposed to be doing, and therefore the person is dead. For a Christian, we describe it as the separation of the soul from the body, which adds this very spiritual element. It also means that there is no such, there is no uh, natural uh, tool to understand it perfectly, right? Like there is no, you know, anima meter, right? There's no way to read the soul by like clicking a trigger like you can with a temperature, you know, or, or you know, put a cuff around your arm and, like we would with blood pressure and now, and now, oh, there's the soul, right? No, it doesn't work that way. So, so when we talk about death, we're not trying to get to like the exact moment of death, like a, like a scientific understanding, um, which is a little bit more debated than I realized um, when I first started learning about this. Um, you know, with the difference between brain death and cardiac death and pulmonary death. Um, but rather that, that final moment of, of life, that separation of the soul from the body, um, and, and how that really is meant to show something of God's goodness in a very um, strange way. So when we look to, to death, we kind of think of it sometimes on... Secular culture is just, it's just a natural, cor natural part of the course of the human life. It's the end of it, sure, but it's just, just always going to happen. It was always part of the plan, but we actually know that's not true. That death doesn't enter the world until after sin enters the world. Man was l meant to live in uh, perfect harmony with God, with perfect justice, uh, and then obviously the original sin ruins that. It ruined original justice. It ruined the preconcupiscence. It ruined all those preternatural graces. All of that stuff is wildly unimportant for you, but basically I'm just showing that this is well thought out ideas. That, And we hear in, um, in uh, Romans from St. Paul that uh, the wages of sin is death. And so we understand sin or understand death as a result of sin, not as part of the normal goodness of, of God, but rather as a remedy, a remedy for the discord of, the, of this world. That, that in order to truly be back to that original happiness, there needed to be a restoring. And so death becomes this 
with this newness, this new cre creation, in order to allow us to live in a new creation. It becomes this means to an ultimate end. So when we were stuck in sin, Christ dies for us, it makes a remedy out of the curse, and then we are able to live in a new way. Now, why do we have, why do we have death? It's long and short. It helps us to escape from the res other results of sin from the sufferings. It makes us, uh, because even though it is not all evil, the, the work that we do, we weren't meant to do, right? When, uh, when Genesis talks about the punishment of Adam, he says, you will always work, or by the, the sweat of your brow will you toil, right? It was not meant to be so. We were meant to have a greater harmony. We were meant to have a, a, a simpler existence, if you will, a more as we now know, heavenly existence, something that was much easier. And, and that not, not doesn't exist in this world, and it can't. We, have, we, would have, we need a new heaven and a new earth, which only comes through death. So when we enter into this death, when we, when we look into this mystery, we always look at it in terms of a darkness, right? Because all senses are lost, right? All, all the things that we know are missing. But what it also sh we also should know when we look to it, is, is Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Near verdant pastures he gives me repose. Besides restful water he leads me. Lo, lo though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, no evil will I fear. There with your crook and staff you guide me. That when we look to scripture, we aren't looking for a remedy for death as if it were some magical concoction, right? There is no uh, fountain of youth, Right? There is no elixir of life. There's no kind of right mixture of crystals and, and oils that will get us to live forever. But rather, to come through death perfectly is to follow after the shepherd. And it's a beautiful way in which we should understand it. Right? Something that we may not understand about death is that, or understand about shepherding, is that the crook and the staff often are seen as an instrument of punishment. Right there, it's the the crook is there to grab by the neck the sheep to bring them back in line, but it really wasn't in at least in the song. Right, the crook and the staff was that was that rod, right, that the walking stick, and the shepherd would go to the right, he would hit to the right, and he would hit to the left. He would make this noise, and the idea was that the sheep would know, don't walk past that 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 bang. Right, stay in between the lines. Right. Follow after where your shepherd has walked and you will be okay, right? So when, our, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and then, he, and then he takes on to himself this Psalm 23, what we're learning is that his death shows us what we also are doing and what will come for us after death, which namely is the resurrection. Now, how do we get there though? How do we get from death to the resurrection? Well, that... That is what we talk about next. It's the once we die, we come to this immediate moment of judgment. All right, it is a particular judgment, is what we refer to it as the first judgment that we undergo, where we are led. Oftentimes, it's thought of by our guardian angel at the to the foot of Jesus to to have revealed to us all that we have done, right and wrong, good and bad, and and also to see God's plan for us and how well we followed it and how well we steered off course and what we were meant to actually be doing the whole time. Uh, and, and it can be a little intimidating, sure, which is why in the funeral uh, mass we pray that we, uh, he or she, the deceased, who knew, uh, knew, God, knew Jesus as a, a loving Savior would now find in him a merciful judge. That we have this prayer that says, we're going to go to the foot of Christ and he's going to show us what we have done. Now that can be intimidating sounding, sure, but we're, we're always, remember, we should keep in mind that God is the only one who truly forgives and forgets, right? He's the only one who actually is able to hear this sin, forgive it, absolve it, wipe it away, and truly then move with, a, we move with a new life in him. Uh, there's actually a great story. So um, if you've ever wondered on the stained glass in the church in the front, Right? There's the heart of Jesus. Right, Jesus is showing a sacred heart. And there's a nun uh, kneeling at his feet receiving this image of the sacred heart. Her name is St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. And Margaret Mary was 
a, a cloistered sister, which means that she didn't leave the monastery. She was always behind them. They lived in the community and they never left. The, so they escaped from the world to be in prayer. And, and even amongst these very prayerful and holy women, it was strange to see images, right? It was strange to have an apparition of, of our Lord come to them. So, you know, when she goes forward and says, I'm seeing Jesus and he's talking to me, I'm sure part of them are thinking, man, we took a crazy one in. Right? And, and so they said, okay, you need, to, you need to talk to a spiritual director. It needs to be one of the best. And then, so she says, okay, I want this guy. And this, this man, you know, this, this saintly priest says, okay, um, well, I don't, I don't know if I believe you. And if I don't believe you, then I can't help you. Um, so you know what? I'm going to test your vision. He goes, if it's really Jesus, he'll be able to tell me this. He goes, Who, what was my last mortal sin? And you come back and you tell me what my last mortal sin was. And, and, if it's, and if it's right, then I'll be your spiritual director. And so Margaret Mary goes, waits for the next apparition of Jesus. Jesus shows up. She says, okay, well, Father says I need to know his last mortal sin. Can you tell me? And Jesus' response was, he brought it to me in confession. I do not remember it. And she went back to the priest, and the priest says, okay, what is it? And she says, Jesus says he doesn't remember. You brought it to him in confession, and it was wiped clean. And he goes, all right, it's real, right? And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing for us to hear, is that God doesn't want to just kind of cover over it or just kind of say, no, 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 don't worry about it, or, or he keeps it kind of in his back pocket waiting for us to screw up again and be like, see, you always do this, right? Like a, like a wife nagging their husband, right? No, it's like, it's very much the opposite. It is truly renewed in, in our relationship through, through his grace. So we come to this particular judgment and we're led to the foot of Christ and he shows us all of these things so that we can kind of know. Now, what's important to remember during this moment is how we know things, right? This is, this is kind of a, a, well, so an anthropology question. So it's how do we know things? Epistemology, it's the worst philosophy class you can take. No, maybe not, but it's pretty close because it's just so like you're like reflecting on how you can reflect and thinking about how you think and trying to know how you can know, right? It's, it's literally the worst of philosophy classes. But it's also very powerful once you start to realize certain things. So when you come to how we know, everything we know, we know through our senses. We either see and therefore read things. We hear it from somebody else. We, uh, we touch it. We taste it. We use our senses to get to knowledge of something. Well, when the soul is removed from the body, we no longer have senses. But we can still know. So we start to know like God knows. We often talk about God dwelling within us. That is how God knows things. Because he created it, he doesn't know things outside in. He knows things from the inside out. He knows them perfectly and then sees afterwards the defects. We see the defects and then eventually are able to pull together what, a, what the thing is, right? So you've seen a hundred chairs and you now know what a chair ought to look like. And so when you see a chair with three legs, you look at it and go, I ain't sitting on that, right? It's going to fall over. I know they're supposed to have four, four legs. And if they have three, then it better be evened out in a certain way and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, you, you kind of can get that. Well, God knows the other way. He knows what a perfect chair should look like. And then only afterwards does he see where everything else comes. So at our judgment, we will know that way as well. Um, it'll be kind of this real understanding of what happened. Because, I don't know about you, but oftentimes after, my, after I've sinned, and I've kind of had time to reflect on it, or, or you know, even just in interactions, you, know, you look back afterwards and you're like, yeah, it turns out I didn't know as much as I thought I knew right? I, I reacted with, with great anger because I thought I was being mistreated because of this, or I thought they had said this about me, or, or whatever it may be. And so you, I reacted out of an ignorance. Well, at the judgment, we won't have any more ignorance. We will know things more perfectly than we could ever know in this life, right? Which then fixes our will, right? It keeps us united in one way because when we come to this, if we're clear of all mortal sin, the type of sin that cuts us off from, from the grace of God, I'll, I'll explain in a second what a mortal sin is, but it cuts us off completely from the grace of God. If we are free from anything of any of those categories, then we can move into uh, 
eventually we become a holy soul. We either go straight to heaven or mediatedly we go to purgatory. So I'm moving quickly. I get that, but I'm trying. All right. So then what is a mortal sin? Well, a mortal sin is a, is a, is a, a type of sin that is a, or a category of sins, I should say, that have three distinct characteristics and all three must be present for a sin to truly be mortal. One, it has to be grave matter, right? I throw the pen at Deacon Bill, it's not really going to hurt him, right? So it can't be grave sin, you know? But if I throw a rock at him, you know, and I, and I whip it at him, I throw it at his face, like that, it's going to hurt a lot. <laughs> it becomes important matter, okay? Or, you know, you, you've left the bank and you kept the pen, right? Okay, the thing's like 50 cents, you know, not really a big deal. Don't do it, but you know, not, you're not going to hell over stealing a pen. You rob the bank, <laughs> you know, that's a grave sin, right? I often tell, people often say, I, oh, I stole something, right? In confession, okay, well, okay, well, what did you steal? And they're like, well, a piece of candy. Okay, well, uh, it's good to bring it to confession, but it's not a mortal sin, right? And then, but I'm waiting for the day where I'm like, okay, well, what did you steal? And they're gonna be like, a PS5. And I'm like, yeah, good thing you brought it here, right? That's a big deal. It's several hundred dollars. That's a, that's a, I mean, there's not like a real cutoff point, but you can see how that's a much bigger deal. Also, you know, stealing five dollars from uh, from somebody who has it versus feel, stealing five dollars from the homeless guy is a different thing, right? So it's not as, so much the monetary value, also in in that. But keep it in mind. So first thing, grave matter. Is it a big deal? If the answer is yes, then we move to the next category. You have to have full knowledge. What does that mean? You have to know what you're doing. You can't accidentally commit a mortal sin, right? Or what often happens, and you guys will be as, as well formed in these, uh, as we get down into the, the, the different types of uh, sins, as we go through the 10 commandments later on in this class, um, also the positive sides of the 10 commandments, but um, we come to full knowledge of sin. Oh, and that it is a mortal sin, right? So sometimes we are like, oh, I didn't even know that was wrong to do. Okay, well, it's a sin still, because objectively it's wrong. You probably should have. Um, but you, if you didn't know it was, you know, um, for example, um, it does happen as, you know, things as, as culture kind of uh, degrades for, um, from, from its Christian roots and things aren't spoken of in the same way, things that we thought were fine to do or weren't fine a year, decades ago are now considered okay, and so you did them, and it's not a mortal sin because you, couldn't, you didn't know. Well, once you know, you live in more freedom, but you also have a greater responsibility because of that gift of freedom. So, grave matter, full knowledge. The last is full will, right? So I tell, uh, I tell Owen he has to rob a bank or I'll kill him, right? He doesn't have free will, right? He, he can, you know, not that that's always the example, but it is the extreme example to kind of highlight if you don't know that you're going to do it, or if you don't, if you don't have full ability to kind of control it, here's the other end of that is a child who, um, you know, who is unable to drive themselves to mass um, on Sunday and ask their parents, hey, will you take me to Sunday mass? And the parent says, no, you know, they, they don't commit a mortal sin. They don't have the ability, they don't have the freedom, the consent to not be able to go. Um, or if you're <laughs> persecuted, or if you're in the middle of a pandemic, right? Uh, that, that these are all examples of when, you know, the, you don't have the freedom to do the correct thing, right? So, um, so, grave matter, full knowledge, full freedom. Now, that's the first judgment, the particular judgment where we will see our life in, a, in the fullness. God will show it to us and we will know in a, to a degree what he knows. It's not total, it's not perfect knowledge, we're still not God, uh, but we know in a more perfect way than we do on earth. And then at the end of the ages, which is purposefully vague, for only the Father knows, not no angel, not even the Son of Man knows when the, t when the Son of Man will return, that... Then we will have what's called the, the, um, the general judgment, where we will see all things. So not only will I know my sins and also God's plan for my life, I will see where our plans, in, or the plans that God has for each of us intersect. And we will see where we did well to come together, where it didn't go, right? So you'll see kind of the grander scheme of what God is doing. It's a beautiful thing. 
a little bit of a mystery for sure, but it's uh, it's been testified to, and so um, we continue to teach it. All right. Now I'm going to pause there just for a quick second. Is there any questions about death or judgment? Okay, it's pretty. I mean, I don't th it's not terribly shocking. It's not it shouldn't be incredibly new. Um, now I'm going to start with hell. Uh, because, um, well, because it's, it's pretty much, of the next three, it's my least favorite thing to talk about, right? <laughs> because, because hell, in, in a sense, has something to do with uh, not just the mercy of God, but also His justice. It uh, shows His goodness and that He does not force us into a place in which we do not desire, we did not choose. And so we have this understanding as hell is a real place. And we talk about two pains of hell. All right. uh, tradition does. The first pain is the pain of the senses. That's the actual things that are done. And the second is the pain of loss. So the pain of the senses is that punishment, that real punishment that we get, that we receive and, and is inflicted upon us because as a, as a, in reparation for our sins, for, for lack of a better word, um, or in, as a response to our sin, I should say. So um, we're often, we're, you know, Dante refers to it in the Inferno as we are punished as we lived, right? So a person who, um, who sinned against anger often will be, um, will receive in kind, will receive a different punishment than the person who is greedy, right? Who is different than a person who is lustful and et cetera, et cetera, right? Each, each will be punished in his own way. But the things of hell, like it's testified to by Christ himself, he says, um, when referring to Judas, it would have been better for that man if he had never been born. He, he says that there will be those who will be outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. And he often refers to it as Gehenna. Now, Gehenna was an actual place on the edge of Jerusalem. It was the place of a of, of, of fiery pit of trash, right? So you can just imagine the awfulness of that. You can imagine the awful smell. You can imagine the, the fact of who actually lived there it was the worst of society, right? Because they always came back with, I'm sure, a bitterness, with a, with a certain uh, just kind of, you knew they were coming before you could see they were coming, right? Um, and so it's kind of, a, it's a, in a way, Christ himself is saying, there, this, going to be a, this is a painful place and you should desire to avoid it. Right? It's, a, it's a good desire to say, um, I, I'm afraid of hell. Um, but it's not, it's not the fullness of what we, we are going for, but it is there. So, um, so Christ testifies to the fact that it is real. We, we as a church, never say so-and-so is in hell. You know, we, we hold out hope for each individual that they are not in hell, right? So we actually hope Hitler's not in hell. Do I think Hitler's in hell? Uh, well, I, am I saying that as a priest? No. Uh, or as, as, a, as a speaking for the church? No, because the church has never said a single person is in hell. We do say a lot of people are in heaven, <laughs> but, but we never say for sure because we just desire that God's mercy is received by everyone before their death. Now, are we pretty certain somebody's there? Yeah. Uh, and if they go there, will they stay there? Yeah. Um, that, that we know at, the, at just as God takes what we've done in this life and rewards him, he also will take what we've done in this life and then give us what we've desired in it, right? Because that's the reward. The, re the What we do when we show charity to one another and, and, and love of God through our acts of worship and, and piety, we are saying, I desire heaven. We may not consciously be thinking that. I get that. I oftentimes, when I'm in the middle of celebrating Mass or giving a homily, I'm not thinking, all right, right now I desire heaven, right? Uh, ideally, that's how it's supposed to be, right? No married couple thinks that all the time. But it's what they're showing, right? You wash the dishes. You're not thinking, man, I love my wife right now. Maybe you are. But, but like, you're, you're just saying that I am doing this to say it without having to say it and having to think it. It is what is right towards her, and I do that because I love her. Well, that is how our whole life is with God. I desire to love God, and so my life will be lived in this way, to, give, to be pleasing to Him, and then, therefore, to get... Um, the reward that he desires us to have more than we desire us to have it, um, namely heaven. But going back to hell. So, and the opposite is also true. When we say, I don't care for, the, care for you, he's not going to force us into it. And therefore, we have to have a place separated from him. 
um, and we would desire, but we would still chase after those created goods that will only cause us pain in the end. Um, you will hear sometimes about uh, a temp the hell is temporary, and, and a few of the church fathers actually did speak of that, that hell would one day be empty. Doesn't, it's impossible to know until, and we'll know at some point in the final judgment, but, um, but it really seems to be that it's not. Uh, almost every theologian and scripture itself kind of testifies to the fact that it is definitive. So I, I bring that up to say it's not true. Um, so, oh, the second pain, that's the pain of the senses. It will be the physical stuff. It'll be the fire. It'll be all that, all, all that nasty, the sulfur, the chaos, the screaming that will be, well, that will be down there, right? There's no peace there. Right? And these demons are there that are created to, to in part, to torment us, right? To, to, to inflict this punishment, are like bullies. You ever see a bunch of bullies get together? You ever hear the laughter? It's like one of the worst sounds on earth, right? You know, there's like, there's like really good laughter out of children, right? It's like one of the best feelings to just hear a child laugh just out of control. It's, it is. It's like an amazing feeling. And then there is the laughter of a bully who is just harsh and, and hate-filled, and that's what's all around, right? So all of the senses are overwhelmed. Hell is loud and, <laughs> and, and to be avoided, right? So that's the pain of the senses. And then there is the pain of loss, which means it is the separation from God because as uh, C.S. Lewis describes it, hell is locked from the inside. Because we choose it, we want God to be away. But there's also a pain because that's who we were created to be in relationship with. We were meant for, to be with him, and now we're not. And so we're aching for something that we know we can never have, right? Um, to ache for something that is just always going to be out of reach. You, and, and to be unable, because of our pride, to accept that, that it won't happen. And St. Um, John Chrysostom says that the pain of loss is as if a thousand of the pain of the senses were stacked on top of one another and it still is worse, right? That, that it is both. And all of this is to say it is what is desired by the person who, who rejects God throughout his life. So then we turn to the, to the soul who has been judged to be free of mortal sin. He has kept himself close to God, but is not quite perfect because heaven is perfect, right? Heaven is, is an absolute perfect union with the Father, and, and I'll get in a second to describe that, but, but how does it happen for the majority of people, majority of us, who do or are not yet ready to go to heaven, who are not yet ready to come and dwell in the loving presence of the Father, right, and, and, and take part in that beatific vision? We'll get to what that is in a second. That's where purgatory comes in. Purgatory, I, I described it... Uh, years ago as, as a sort of kind of finishing school, right? Once you're in, you're set, right? But purgatory is not a place to be feared. We shouldn't desire it necessarily because it's not, you know, you know, easy. Uh, but, but it is a holy soul who has entered purgatory. He's guaranteed his salvation, right? We aren't. We can still, we're, we can still change. Our wills change all the time. How often do we have we looked, gone after something and then said, ah, actually, it turns out the diet's a little too hard, right? Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, maybe I'll do this career. Well, it turns out I, you know, I, I was pre-med in undergrad and I got all the way through. I think you need, you need to take 10 courses and I got through nine of them, right? And I dropped out at physics two. Why? Because I knew I wasn't going to be a doctor. And why was I going to take physics two my last semester of college? I'm not an idiot. Um, and so you, you, we do that though. Our will is fixed on something. We can even go really far, but we can give up because we change. We, we are able to do that. A, a soul that is separated from the body doesn't change, but it doesn't always mean, it doesn't mean it's, it's ready for God, right? And it's a beautiful teaching, right? Because even though it is painful, right? And the soul in purgatory desires to escape it and desires to, to, to dwell in heaven where it was meant to be. Um, and it, and there's a certain similarity to the pains of hell with the pains of purgatory. Um, and that the soul in purgatory is unable to escape on their own. They have to be freed by the charity of others. So we are called to pray for them, um, which is why today the feast of St. Gertrude, who has a very popular, uh, famous prayer to, uh, 
um, to release the souls from purgatory. It's a beautiful thing, and we should all do it. But when we look to this, uh, this teaching on purgatory, that is by its nature temporary, but it is um, also not something. It also speaks, I think, very powerfully to the difference in how we as Catholics understand justification and salvation, right? So a, a literal quote of Martin Luther is that man is, man, a, a, the saved man is nothing but a pile of manure covered in snow, right? That Luther and, and many of the reformers who followed him, almost all of them actually, saw salvation as a, what we call a juridical act, that God just overlooks all of our flaws, right? He sees that we are hurting and he says, don't worry about it. I'm wiping it clean. You don't have any debt to me anymore, right? Which is true. We don't have a debt to, to the Father anymore because Christ has paid that cost. But God is more than that. <laughs> uh, he, he doesn't want to look down on us and say, just don't worry about it, guys. I got it. God looks at us with real pity, with compassion. He suffered for us and with us in our language, in our ways, in our body. And with that in mind, he looks to us and says, and I'm going to heal you. Your salvation will be so great that you will actually be renewed, regenerated, uh, rejuvenated, brought into your youth, brought into your perfection that you were meant to be. And I'm going to make it so. And that's what purgatory does is instead of just saying God overlooks your flaws for all eternity, he says, I'm going to heal all of your flaws so that you can love perfectly in heaven. It's a huge difference that is lost when we lose purgatory, right? To have this time after death that says the soul will be made new, right? To ha to, to, and, and the whole body eventually will be raised up into this perfection of what God was originally created us to be. It, it is profound what has happened when we lose this. Now, of course, you know, Luther got rid of the, got rid of purgatory in part because he saw the abuses of the indulgences and that's its own different thing. Um, that was a practice that needed to be fixed. <laughs> but, you know, it turns out buying your way into heaven isn't a real good option. Anyway, it says uh, Simeon, or Simon, uh, the magician in Acts, who dies because he tries to buy the holy orders. This is where simony comes from. So, well, what, what are we to do with this teaching? So we hear that, that Christ, is, our God, is offering out to us this rejuvenation, this regeneration, and, and purgatory highlights this. So what do, what do we do? When we hear about praying for the souls of the faithful departed, as we do all of the month of November, or if we hear about gaining indulgences or praying for the dead, why do we do all that? Well, one, it's always been done. Uh, the fathers in the first century testify to this practice. So there's something good in, the, in how ancient it is and the fact that it goes to first and second century fathers of, of the rules for how to pray for the dead too. Not just like, like, oh yeah, it's a good practice, do what you want. But like, do that for him, don't do that for him. You know, like, like there was like a real like concerted effort to make sure that it was done correctly. It's beautiful. So what are we to do with this? Well, we do it because they... Because they, their wills are fixed and because nothing about them changes, right? Because what changes in us is the material, right? The, the fleshy part of us, but not our, 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 our soul, after, especially after death. And so a soul doesn't change after death. And so we help them by our prayers. It is a great act of charity. It's one of the greatest acts of charity to do, right? Because, um, you know, you give a guy, um, you know, you give a guy a hundred bucks, it's great. Um, but if, if I get, if I write Bill Gates a check for a hundred dollars, I'm not really helping him all that much, right? He doesn't need it, you know, but if I give a hundred dollars to the guy who's, you know, been sitting at the, at the street corner living there for the last month or so, it changes his life, right? <laughs> you know, like he, he can actually eat, he can actually sleep in a warm bed tonight, you know, like it, 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 when you are in greater desperation, charity means more. And so for a soul that can, or for, for a person who cannot be, ch or cannot change on their own, namely a soul in purgatory, to be helped is a greater act of charity. Why do I say all that? Well, because in this month we should take 
pride in the fact that we spend a month to pray for the souls and then and we should make this act so what is this teaching on indulgence you know because because if this was one of the big sticking points of of the reformation then it's worth looking at um and an indulgence basically is is we are literally indulging in the mercy of god so we are basically taking advantage of this inexhaustible uh, treasury of, of goodness that God has given to the church, right? He has won every good thing for us through his cross. And so with that in mind, and because the church is the spouse of Christ, and therefore, just like our marriages are, they, they share everything in common. So when Christ wins something good, the church has something good. And so the church says, these are things to take advantage of this goodness we're indulging in, in that mercy of God. And so the church says, these practices will gain an indulgence. There's two types, full and partial. The full is also called plenary because that's the Latin word for full is plena. Um, and, uh, and then partial just means it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not full. <laughs> um, but it means that it's, it's kind of, of a lower uh, sacrifice of, of either time or, or charity. And so uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the full power um, that, a, that a larger thing would. Um, and what are these acts? Well, too many to mention, right? There's, a, there's actually a whole book on them, um, books about 100 pages. But things like praying a rosary, and there are certain conditions that always come with a plenary or an indulgence. One, you have to receive, or you have to go to the sacrament of confession and be detached from all, uh, or you have to be detached totally from sin, or, yeah. Uh, two, you have to receive uh, the Eucharist. Three, you have to pray for the intentions of the Pope, the Holy Father. Now, obviously, the sacraments you guys can't receive yet, but you, God willing, will come Easter. And, and so it's basically usually considered 21 days before or after the act of indulgence. And, and confession and the Eucharist are, can be applied to one, one instance of that can be applied to many indulgences. So things like praying a rosary in public, that gains you an indulgence. During this year of St. Joseph, uh, praying uh, or meditating on his goodness, going to a retreat, all these other options, during November, uh, gains you indulgence. During November, the month of November, going to a cemetery and praying for the dead by saying a creed and our Father gains an indulgence. There, I mean, I'm telling you, it's, it's incredible. When, and to the point where if you make the sign of the cross with holy water, you gain a partial indulgence. When you gaze upon the cross with piety, you gain an indulgence, right? So we want to take advantage of this, and God wants us to take advantage of this. What do you notice about all of these things? They're all good things to do, right? These aren't like sneaky little things, and we're trying to get you to do things. We want you to pray, right? We want you to, to reflect upon these things that make us into saints. And so we make these things, uh, we have a, a certain like prize attached to them, namely greater charity for our neighbor. All right. Now, with that in mind, we we look to um, one of our greatest advocates when it comes to purgatory, which is Mary, or who is Mary? And we'll talk. We haven't talked about Mary yet, have we? No. Yeah, Mary's in a couple of weeks, and uh, and and one of the things is she sits as uh, often referred to as the queen of, of purgatory. Is she she desires, you know, because she didn't have to undergo purgatory, right? She her she was perfect at. Uh, and from the moment of her conception all the way to her death, she pulls out souls out of, out of purgatory because she desires all to live in her kingdom of queen, or, or <laughs> kingdom of, or, yeah, the kingdom of heaven where she, where she sits as queen. So that allows us then to turn to, to the final thing, which is heaven. The ultimate goal, that which we were created for. And then it's referred to in... Um, in our liturgy, if we look to the first Eucharistic prayer. So if you go to Mass on Sunday, almost every week here, we say the Eucharistic prayer. So that's the prayer 
Um, if you've ever been confused when you hear Latin being sung and you hear Sanctus, 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 right? That one. Um, that, starting at that prayer all the way until you say Amen is what's called the Eucharistic prayer. And there's a part where the priest, he bows down and, he, and um, then he signs his cross as uh, filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. And then, and then we pray for the dead. And at the end of that prayer for the dead, we say, uh, give them a place of refreshment, light, and peace. Right? Those are the qualities of heaven. That there are three, I would say it was probably the three most important qualities of heaven. Right? Without actually getting to like the actual essential of what heaven is. That what we can know about heaven are those qualities of refreshment. Of a, of a removal of all anxieties, of both emotional and physical pain, suffering, and turmoil. There is no <laughs> difficulty in heaven. Now, don't think of it in too material of a way, right? I remember I was on my way, um, on my way to a um, vigil service. So the night before a funeral, oftentimes a funeral home, you'll have a vigil service, and you say some prayers. And it was up at Raymond's, which is up Washington Avenue, and... I, so I go out to the parish, I go on uh, Charles and uh, make that left turn. And at Martin's, it says the deceased name, and then it says crabbing in heaven. And I was like, Ugh. so that was what I talked about at this vigil service. That was my homily. I said, listen, I'm not trying to say like crabbing's not fun. I'm saying heaven is that much better. I said, because like the reality of crabbing is that you don't know what you're going to get out of it. And it's actually quite a bit of work. You have to actually do the tying. You actually have to do all these things. And let's be honest, most of the time it's really just an excuse to drink all day. Right? And, and I was like, it's not, that's not what this is. We will be refreshed without even having to do the work of picking up the beer. Right? Like you will be, like, it will be a place of, of perfection in, in all things. Which we too often try and make it materialized. Right, which is a not perfected thing, right? So what do I mean by that? Is is I remember um, my first parish. I was talking to an eighth grader, and she goes, "I don't know that I want to go to heaven." And I was like, "All right, well you're a punk. What do you mean by that?" And and I was right. She was a punk. And she goes, she goes, "No, I'm serious. I think I like I just think it'll be bored." Like, I'll just be bored in heaven. And I was like, "You understand hell's gonna be worse, right? Like, you know, you're not really making sense." And and but. You know, but I listened to her, right? I was much calmer with her than I am in this talk right now. And she was like, she's like, no, but seriously, like, like, I like to learn things, but then, like, eventually I move on. Like, I played piano, and then I got good enough at it, and I got bored with it, and I moved on to another instrument. Or I was learning about this, and now I kind of feel like I don't want to learn about this, this period of history anymore, so now I'm going to read the science book. And I said, great. I said, that sounds nice, but you're not really getting to real perfection. You're trying to say, I want to be the perfect, most perf perfect thing at this. And, and, if I, and maybe I'll get bored with it. Well, that's because your heart's not there, right? Like, look, heaven doesn't have this, like, sort of kind of perfection, which we kind of think of. It's kind of temptation to make it lower than it really is. But the refreshment is, is, that, is, is something greater than can be described. No eye has seen, no ear has heard the wonders that God has in store for those who love him. I think it's Ecclesiastes. So, with that in mind, we turn to light, right? Hell is full of darkness with the only light coming from its punishments. Well, the lightness of heaven is that we will know all things. Darkness instills fear because there is a lack of knowledge. There will be a perfection of true knowledge on all things. And so we have this lightness to it. And obviously it's not material, it's not corporal, it's, it is a lightness of, of what, like the, what the enlightenment sought some 200 years ago, of perfect wisdom and knowledge that it failed at, but in heaven it will not fail us, for this will truly come from God. And the last is peace, and peace being not just an absence of distress and strife, because we actually pray for that during Mass. Um, but rather, it is a peace that is an actual gift. It is the presence of God. So, why do, I ha why do I say all of these things to kind of get to heaven? Well, because all of those things stem from the one reality of heaven, which is that we can gaze upon God face to face. That we can look into Him, and He looks back at us. In its most perfect description, it is the gaze of love. 
And I know that's not enough. <laughs> if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, like in the eyes of, in the, with the ears and eyes of faith, we can kind of get it. But, but we can gaze upon God and is it a perfect exchange of love? I, I, I don't know how else to describe it, but I love seeing teenage couples, right? Because they, because they're so ridiculous, right? Because they always try and do over the top things, right? Like you ever watch like, like, I don't know when, so when I was, when I was in like high school and, and, and in college, uh, AIM, AOL Instant Messenger was really popular, right? Like it was, and, and you had the away messages and you know, I don't know, I don't know anything. I don't know nearly enough about social media anymore to know if there's anything similar to this, but you used to like, if you weren't going to actively chat or sometimes even when you were going to actively chat, you would put a message for everyone to see out to the world. Right? It was just so wonderful for, for everyone to know exactly what you were doing. Because sometimes it was going to the bathroom. Right? But like when you started dating somebody, when you were like a junior, you were like, oh my gosh, I just absolutely love Jimmy. Right? And it was like, it was just so over the top. Right? And I remember my mom being like, oh my gosh, you must have diabetes. And I was like, that joke is, what are you talking about? I don't, like mom, you like, first off, you make my doctor's appointments. What are you talking about? She goes, because that message was just so sweet. And I was like, I hate you, right? Like, I was like, but my mom is really funny. So I, she got away with it. And um, so we have this, like, like that's what, like, like fake love is because then you know six months later you absolutely hate each other and you're, I can't believe I ever fell for them, right? But like true love is, is like the, the elderly couple who doesn't have to say a word. Right? Who can constantly, who can just be in each other's presence, with a with a tranquility of heart and mind, knowing that they have everything, when they have each other. It is a true perfection of of I don't have to say a word because you know what I'm thinking. I don't have to explain to you how I feel because you know it better than I do. Right? The gaze of love is something so, so profound that even when we see it, we're like I don't I don't know what to say. It's there. And maybe it's not even recognized until it's lost. But in heaven, we'll be able to recognize it without it being lost, right? Heaven is beyond any grand description, which is why it's so tough to, to describe, right? It's, it's, it's easier to, say, to describe hell because it's about the loss of what we will have in heaven. But, but there is nothing lacking. And it doesn't mean that everyone's equal in heaven, right? There are ranks. There's just like there are ranks of angels. There are ranks of saints. And that's fine because everyone will have their fullness, right? Um, everyone will have exactly what they are ready to receive, right? Because if I, um, you know, if, if, you know, I get told, okay, uh, you know, I don't know, if you ever, I don't know, like a PT test, right? For example, if you're told, you know, at, you, know, if I, you tell an 18 year old, okay, run two miles. They're like, okay, whatever, right? Like most of the time, not all the time, but you run two miles, they're like, fine, whatever. And they go and, and they don't have to stretch and they can like do it in their dress pants and it's fine, right? And like, I, you know, they, I'm 35 and I'm not, so I'm still not old. And it's like, okay, go run two miles. It's like, give me 10 minutes, right? Like, and I got to go get my real shoes on because I, I won't, I want to be, don't want to be out of commission for the next two days, right? Because that's just the reality is you can only do as much as you are prepared to be able to do. Well, in heaven, it's the same. You can only receive as much love as, your, as you are able. And we prepare for that now, right? By the holiness we share or we experience or give, however you want to describe it now, we it was, we're described, I think, by Teresa of Avila as in heaven always having a full cup, but on earth we are molding that cup, right? So we are constantly expanding it so that in heaven we can receive a greater amount of happiness in God's grace. Um, but we can also shrink it by saying, I just want to get to like the lower rank of heaven and like I'll get in there and squeeze by and it'll be fine, right? We're, we're just missing out. But so, um, but there won't be jealousy. Because right? we're still going to be perfect charity. We're still going to love uh, in a perfect way. And so it won't be like, all right, well, like I'm in like, I'm like a level six saint and you're a level like, like two saint and like he, you don't like me because of it. No, like we're, we're all so thrilled to be in the presence of God that it's really kind of a, an unimportant teaching. <laughs> but at the same time, it's good to see that like we gain goodness, like a merit um, by what we do on earth. Uh, it prepares us to receive God better uh, in the world to come, which is what we're meant to do. It's, it's, <laughs> we're meant to live not for this world, but for the one to come. So why have all of these, 
Um, why have this class dedicated to the last things? Well, one, it can be probably one of the most intimidating. It's one of the most intimidating teachings, not so much because um, we don't believe it already, but because we do believe it already and we need to get rid of some false teachings too, because it starts to reveal a little bit more about why we talk about everything else, why we talk about the moral life, which we'll talk about sorry, uh, after the new year. Um, we talk about the moral life because it, it sets us up to come to this moment of judgment and then to receive heaven or hell more perfectly. We, we discuss these things because in doing so, hopefully, we begin to see a little bit more about how God desires us to be now and how he looks upon us, right? Because we can look, we can have it as he is distant and just wants to judge us at the end and be okay, okay with it. But the reality of this whole teaching on the last things is that it should show to us, no, he cares for us right now. He wants a real healing. He wants a real perfection in us and for us. He wants us to have that salvation that he won for us on the cross by his perfect love that laid down his life for the sake of his friends. That when we look upon these last things, what we are looking about, looking on is not so much how it affects me, but how it fits into God's plan. How it fits into God's desire for us to know Him and to live with Him, to serve Him, to love Him. And so we end this class with, with again, one of those wonderful acts of charity to pray for the living and the deceased. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of this time. We ask again for your blessing. We ask that you may uh, bring us ever closer to you in this life, that we may gaze upon you wonderfully in the world to come. We ask, Heavenly Father, that all that we do may show our love for you. And in this moment, as we pray for all the souls in purgatory that we ask for in a special way for your mercy to be poured out upon them. And Heavenly Father, we ask in humility that you hear this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.